Let's talk about Hawkmoon, History of the Runestaff by Michael Moorcock. This is four short novels or long novellas published between 1967 and 1969 uh, by Michael Moorcock, the writer of the Elric stories most famously, but also Corum, Dances at the End of Time and a variety of other quite famous uh, fantasy stories which connect into one big multiverse. Hawkmoon is one of his many avatars of uh, the Eternal Champion. Um, most famously, Elric is an Eternal Champion. And so Hawkmoon is, is one of the many avatars of this kind of eternal, doing good, being righteous kind of character that he writes across many of his stories. And there are many good things to say about this book, uh, or several good things, but on the whole, this wasn't great. Um, there are problems with this which recur elsewhere in Moorcock, but which I think might be worse here than elsewhere in Moorcock. In my limited experience, I've read three omnibuses of his. This one, I've read the first Elric omnibus, and I've read Dances at the End of Time. So I have a limited experience, but uh, and I, I think I enjoyed this more than Dances, less than Elric. But before we get into that, this is the, the basic idea. In a far future, post-apocalyptic, neo-medieval Europe, Dorian Hawkmoon, the title hero, He's a German duke who has been, he tried to resist the dark empire of Grand Britannia as it swept across Europe and he failed and he's now been suborned uh, magically to go and help undermine the last remaining resistance in, in Western Europe at least to the dark empire and its god emperor Huon and this last resistor or the, who refuses to submit is Count Brass, the legendary soldier and diplomat and Hawkmoon's quest to get round his magical problem, to defeat the Dark Empire, uh, which, you know, you can see that's what's going to happen from very early on. They take him around the world and gradually tie into what seems to be the greater plan of an object called the Rune Staff, hence the name. And uh, the, four, the, the, the each of the books inside is named after a magical item, basically. The Jewel in the Skull, which is the magical subordination, subor, uh, suborning, uh, that is used on Hawkmoon, the Mad God's Amulet, the Sword of the Dawn, and the Rune Staff. So you can see there's a progression of these different magical items. We might as well, I think, start with what's weak, because it's good to end on, on good notes uh, if you're otherwise going to be frustrated. I think it's good to end on the positive. Basically, Moorcock, his one, a big one, maybe the biggest, he can't write dialogue. There's a major problem that his dialogue is flat, uncharacterized as stereotyped um, and there may be some intention here it may be somewhat modeled on some of his sword and sorcery heroes uh, but it is a struggle and it um, you know he has an idea about the personalities and presence of his characters he does think that Hawkmoon is one kind of character and Giselda is another kind of character and Count Brass is another kind of character uh, but their voices are often identical and the dialogue often serves as pretty basic exposition rather than, you know, there's no character depth in much of the dialogue. One exception is the French soldier of, of well, of the Dark Empire, Guillaume d'Averc, who's a foppish, decadent, strange, surprising figure who uh, ends up entangled uh, with Hawkmoon due to Hawkmoon fighting against the Dark Empire and that's really interesting. Uh, he's the most realised character probably because he has a distinctive voice. I think that might be why, simply put. He begins, by the way, Moorcock begins to try to improve this, I should give credit. By the end you can tell there's, with a few characters, Orland Fank uh, in the fourth book, and Count Brass as well. Uh, but it, it doesn't really work, part, or at least it doesn't, it's not important. In fact, Count Brass suddenly changing voice to become a more distinctive character is quite disorienting. Wait, what's happened to Count Brass? Has he been replaced by a body snatcher? You know, this is something where the earlier problems haunt Moorcock later, I think. He's incredibly inventive, but, uh, and I'll come back to that as a positive, but because he adheres, well, he adheres to sword and sorcery pacing, conventions you know if you read them where something happens there's a scene there's a dramatic fight then there's a rest oh now something happens you know there's a fairly quick non-stop stream of action and this is often something people comment on favorably in his work it's one way people compare him to Tolkien who he hate he hates Tolkien basically and one way is the idea that he is simply getting stuff done there's lots on the page he fits lots into a 150 page 
book, lots of action, lots of locales, lots of description. And I want to say that that is praise, and I will come back to that to some degree. But basically, sometimes what he is talking about, the places you go to, the action seems neglected or hurried. Uh, basic, I, th I think there's simply sometimes too many things happening and not enough scenes to give emotional weight to the big moments. There's not enough development because of the speed, because of the pacing. And I think that compares unfavorably to Vance or Howard, who are both quick sword and sorcery paced authors a lot of the time. Um, I think they both have their issues to different degrees. Howard is a master, of course, and I think that that's really where he wins out. He knows what he's doing. But both of them are a lot more keen to make sure the stakes have weight. And here, the stakes are massive, but they don't always feel like they have weight because you're hurrying through as if you're reading an outline sometimes. I think it's part of the problem. And of course, the two problems interact. You've got characters who are difficult to connect with, and then you've got this wild variety of amazing things they're doing and visiting, but they don't really land emotionally, these events. And that's a bad combination. Uh, it made it difficult in stretches to get through because it was very hard to know what to care about. There are also some eye-rolling bits of authorial voice. I did a video about the first Elric Omnibus with Liam uh, from Liam's Lyceum. It was a really good spoiler-filled discussion about, about that book. I'll link it in the description. But one thing that came out from that was the degrees which Moorcock knows he's clever and winks at his own cleverness. And here, an example, it's a humorous example, inverted commas, ha-ha. Uh, but the some of the gods the Dark Empire worships turn out to be the Beatles, as in the band. And with funny spellings, because it's the far future and no one remembers their real names or what they really were. And basically it's not very funny. Um, it's, it kind of adds to the surreality of the scene in which it happens, I guess. But it's something where you can tell there's basically an author who winks too often at his audience or an author who is too pleased with himself. I think will often end up distracting the audience from the story. And I think Moorcock sometimes is guilty of that. But there are positive things to say, and I think it's right to credit Moorcock with them. Moorcock is very inventive. Uh, his depiction of the ultra Baroque decadence and horror of Londra, the city, the capital city of um, the, the Dark Empire is, is iconic. I think it's amazing. They're this vast interconnected, a set of metallic buildings covered in horrific bas-reliefs of the things the Dark Empire has done, ruled over. Uh, they, they have no windows because the they people don't want to ever be seen, the, the nobility. Ruled over by the uh, god god emperor Huon, who is a withered old weird creature in a vat of uh, fluid, who's got the stolen larynx of some uh, youth with a beautiful voice from hundreds of years ago. It's all inhabited by animal masked inhabitants of the various orders of the realm um, who can't be seen without their masks, have a horrific fear of being seen as human and of feeling normal human feelings. Uh, that's amazing. Camarg too, which is where Count Brass comes from, is described beautifully. This is the connection is that he really can, at points, describe really well. I'll, I'll read a short section. At dawn, when clouds of giant scarlet flamingos rose from their nests of reeds and wheeled through the sky in bizarre ritual dances, Count Brass would stand on the edge of the marsh and stare over the water at the strange configurations of dark lagoons and tawny islands that seemed to him like hieroglyphs in some primeval language. That's just a really very striking depiction of nature and of uh, someone's experience of nature, of a, of a moment of the sublime. And so that's a really strong part of his, his invention is that he's often able to invent a place and then depict it, describe it really well. Um, he is very good at describing things. It, it approaches real beauty at points and is probably my favourite thing about these books. Uh, and he also is just very inventive. There's lots of interesting, fun things that, um, you know, you'll be like, oh yeah, that's quite memorable. Oh. That was fun. You know, I'm not sure they're always good in terms of they're not always part of a good story, but the actual individual things he invents are often very uh, cool or interesting. And that's no bad thing. He does try to grapple with big themes. And this one, I guess it's about typically for him, law versus chaos and what the balance is, what's better. And sometimes he does it very ham fistedly, but sometimes there's a degree of subtlety and thought, which shows that he's trying to deal with big ideas. In in his critiques of Tolkien, one time he said, uh, I'd rather be a 
bad writer with big ideas than a big writer with bad ideas. And I'm not say I wouldn't say his ideas are good or bad. I think it's up for discussion. But I think it's it's clear that he really does want to talk about things, and that's that's interesting. That's something I did sometimes find interesting in these books. His action scenes are usually good. Sometimes they're not, but usually they're good. And I found the same in Elric that he has a basic facility for description, and that extends to action. Um, there, it's not uh, as brutal and horrific as. Uh, Joe Abercrombie or something can be uh, but it definitely has a degree of grip and reality to it sometimes and the last book in the sequence is probably the best of the four and that means I was less frustrated in the last book than I had been prior to it so you know, it was on the way up and maybe he wrote many of his most famous books in the first decade of his writing you know he's in his 80s now he's been writing for over 50 years nearly 60 years uh, and he probably has improved since the 60s and 70s, which is where I've read his stuff. Uh, but, and maybe you, you see that through these books. So in fairness to him, it may well be that this is not wholly representative of the best of his work. If you're wanting to look at Moorcock, from my very limited experience, I'd start with Elric. That's what I enjoyed most. In terms of Moorcockian multiverse, there are lots of connections, um, which I would have been more interested and excited by, from what I've read, the books I've read, except that I think I was frustrated or bored enough um, and I found them more interesting in Elric because of that and I think now that I've read it and I'm connecting the things in my head it's interesting to kind of compare the more cocky in books and see how they're connecting in terms of his big themes uh, so on the whole I didn't enjoy it as much as I did Elric it's not the worst thing I've ever read by any means it was all perfectly readable at points it was quite good I wouldn't strongly recommend it if you have read it, particularly if you've loved it, tell tell me what you think in the uh, comments and tell me what your other favourite Moorcock books are. Till next time.